Okay, we're going to jump into today one of the other major uh, processes you have to uh, work your way through in Pacific War, and that is ground combat. And in ground combat, the, the first thing I think you need to understand is that the process for actually doing the ground combat and looking at the tables um, figuring out what what columns you're going to be looking at and any kind of modifiers. That part is fairly straightforward and I think easy to follow once you understand what the, the two main charts are for and uh, where you find uh, particular items on those charts. Um, the, the tricky part of ground combat in Pacific War is really the retreats, um, how to handle retreats, what happens as far as um, deactivating or remaining activated, and some of the choices that happen when there's either one or two, uh, both retreating on either side. Um, and that's, that's a whole other section of ground combat that will take on um, after we look at the, the initial process here. Um, as you can see, I have this set up um, with a division of infantry for the American with six troop quality and 16 steps. And they are, they have entered this hex from this hex side on the previous uh, movement phase, uh, advantage movement. And this is a Japanese division of five troop quality and 10 steps. So unlike a lot of um, more traditional hex encounter games, the combat actually happens within the hex. If there is a unit right here, and a unit here, um, there's no combat that takes place. Um, there isn't really a, a zone of control either. Um, it's a matter of, of getting into that hex um, in order to gauge the opposite side. So they moved in, you place a ground attack arrow pointing to the side where they moved into that hex, and that will become important during retreats, as we'll see later. All right. Now to figure out how to use the charts, the first step we do is look at the two troop qualities, six and five. So six is the attacker. In this case, uh, no one is um, broken, so it's just the normal six and five. No one's doing an amphibious assault. So you simply take a look at this upper right chart it's attacker troop quality and defender troop quality and we said six for the american and then you go across until you get the five column for the defender and then you see 11. 11 is the troop quality differential column right here and i do want to say a quick note about the rules i think the way the rules um, are explained in the paragraphs and how to use these charts and um, it can be a little bit confusing. I'm going to grab um, the book to show you why. Okay, so if you look at this section called Lead Ground Unit Troop Quality Modifiers. Um, it throws a bunch of ideas in under this heading, but you have to be careful. This isn't all um, simply talking about the troop quality table and i'll show you what i mean um, it says lead unit is broken have its troop quality so we don't have a broken unit but if we did have a broken unit this six would be halved to three um, if the japanese unit was broken it'd be halved to two and a half round up to three okay so 
It could be because it's broken or it's an amphibious assault. You're going to have that. And in fact, you could have a broken unit. It can be the lead unit in attack. Um, it's not very wise. Um, but you could have an amphibious assault here, have this as a broken unit, and that's halved to three, and then it would be halved again because it's an amphibious assault, um, which would be rounding up to two. So that wouldn't be very wise, but you can do it. Um, so you see this listing of one, lead unit broken half. Okay, broken is half, true probably. Second, lead unit is conducting amphibious assault. We talked about that. Now, then it goes to number three, Jungle Hill Hex or Hex Kenizade River, Defender plus two. But in this case, they're not talking about increasing the defender's troop quality. They're, they're actually talking about um, this shift in the column. And I, one of the things that's confusing, and it doesn't necessarily agree when they talk about Defender plus two or mixed mountain, which we have in this particular situation, Defender plus three. Um, it's in, in this true quality differential column shift modification. Now you can see this makes a little more sense to me because it says if a combat hurdles can juggle heel hex, hex can river two columns to the left. Well, in essence, Going that way is defender plus two or one, whatever. And going that way is attacker positive. So it's not talking about increasing this to seven or eight. It's talking about shifting the columns. And I, and I misread that or was confused by it the first time I tried ground combat. So I want to make that clear that once you've established the troop quality and done this and you get to the column, now we will talk about shifting left or right. Um, and in this case, as I said, we are in, uh, if you could see it, um, we're in mixed terrain. That's this medium green. The lightest is clear, mixed, and then this is um, jungle. Jungle mountain are the same, shift, uh, river is the same. If, you, if you're if you in a river, you're, you're going to want to take whatever is the most advent, advantageous to the defender. So, so that's a mouthful, but um, I just want to make sure you're really clear about that. All right, we've decided six to five. We are on the 11 column originally. We now have to shift over three, so we're now on the eight column. Then we have to decide if there's any die roll modifications. And there you look at the die roll modifier chart, this little tiny chart. And basically it's... It, it, it looks like a complicated set of numbers, but this is the old ratio, like three to one, four to one, or one to two, one to three, that we're, a lot of us are used to. It's just in um, decimal for, form. So to, to kind of bring this down to the nitty gritty, if you've got three to one odds as attacker, you'll get a minus one die roll. Four to one or more, minus two. If you're anywhere between one just above one to three so one to two odds even two to one that there's no modifiers whatsoever once it gets to one to three you have to start adding one and then one to four or less plus two so as an attacker you can actually attack with you know it doesn't have to be a huge force i would say you want to pay more attention to the troop quality because you can, if you have a really, really good troop quality of say six and your opponent is at like three, which sometimes happens, that's 14 column. 
you're talking here now, and it doesn't, it, if you have the 14 column and you're attacking at um, one to three odds, you could still do quite a bit of, um, or have quite a, a positive effect as an attacker. The troop quality is, is m much more significant in my mind than having a, a huge advantage in steps or a, a disadvantage in steps. Um, so keep that in mind as you set up your, your combat attacks. So we established there's no die roll modifier, modifier. We're on the seven column. And then the last thing to do is double check which of these rows you're going to look at. And we have down here 16 plus 10. You can see 16 plus 10, 26 steps. So that's plenty. Um, and whatever die roll we, we get, we'll look at the 17 plus in each of those die rolls. Um, there's the six to 16 and the two to five. Pretty, pretty simple. So we roll, we got a seven, which is not usually good for the attacker. Seven, oh uh, yeah, we were on the seven column, seven. This is not gonna be good. Six step losses and one for the defender. Left side's attacker, right side's defender. I wanna interject uh, just for a moment here uh, about step losses in ground combat, just to make sure you read all the way through, turn the page, uh, I think it's above sieges, and talking about how to take the step losses when you do ground combat. So once, once you've decided whether there's a retreat or not, and how many step losses a uh, uh, unit or units have to take in the final result, all the step losses have to be taken by the lead unit first. Um, so if I had seven, let's just say I had five step losses in a, in a battle with these units, and the U.S. had to take five step losses. They would have to take all five step losses from this, assuming that you use this as the, the lead unit. Now, if I had seven step losses, once you get down to one step on the lead unit, you can start giving um, more steps, step losses to other units that were in the combat. So in the case of seven step losses, I've got nine here. I would take the first five from here, and then I could take two more from this other regiment. Once you get to eight, unfortunately for the American player in this situation, if I got to eight, I would have to uh, then eliminate this lead unit. So you take all the step losses from a lead unit until it gets down to one step left, and then you can go to other units in the hex. If you get down to the situation where you have to eliminate a unit, and since there's nine steps here, and I, if I had an eight-step loss, I would have I couldn't choose to use lose this one. I'd have to use this lead unit for the loss. So that's how step losses work. It's a little bit different than um, when air attacks. Um, when when you're talking about um, air missions. So just keep that in mind, the, the little difference in, in how you distribute your step losses when you're in combat. Uh, it, and it mainly matters, obviously, when you have multiple units in the combat. All right, back to the battle. Um, now, this is where it gets sticky <laughs> because it isn't simply... Um, take the steps off the units, do a retreat, and you're done. There, are, This is where the choices come in. So in the blue, we're going to try three different ways just to demonstrate. In the blue area, you have to retreat as a tactor. It's mandatory. 
in the pinkish red, light red shade, the defender has to retreat in any of these. Let's get a little bit more light. Just a little bit. Um, that helps. Um, and as a mandatory retreat, whether it's defender or um, attacker, there's a process you have to go through, and it's going to involve a TQ check, a true quality check. If if you land anywhere in the white area, it's optional retreat. And the attacker has the option to retreat first. If they don't, then the defender has a chance to retreat. And if neither do, there's a process to go through with that. Okay, so let's take a look at retreating. Now, first up, regardless of whether you've decided to voluntary retreat, um, or that it's mandatory that you retreat. Uh, it doesn't matter how that how you've arrived at that situation, because you'll you'll take a look at the mandatory retreat results. And I would say this little section right here, thirty one point two point two, just have it handy. It would be best to have that retreat little section. Maybe you just. Xerox it and, and cut out that little box because that that's what I'm going to do um, Because there are some choices you have to make um, So if you Are going to retreat and in this case, this is a mandatory retreat by uh, for the US um, They haven't lost their steps yet the first thing is they have to dis to um, if they were broken, they'd have to retreat. Um, no, that's not broken. Isn't flipped. I, I've got a broken marker here. Um, if they if they had been broken for whatever reason before this combat, um, they would they would have to retreat. They wouldn't have a choice. And when I say choice, you say, well, it's a mandatory retreat. Well. This is what happens. It's mandatory, but they can still pass a true quality test. So if I roll a six or less, I can, and it's the lead unit. If there were more than one unit, you'd have to use the unit you used to do the TQ rating when you did the combat. So if I rolled, in this case, I got a one. So that passes the check. So now, if, if it wasn't broken and I passed the check, I can do one of two things. I can retreat all these the, the units that were here. In this case, it's just one. I can retreat, and now I only have to lose half the steps I was supposed to. I think it was five steps, um, and I have to uh, round those up as usual in Pacific War. So. In this case, retreating by passing the true quality check, um, retreating here, I can lose less steps than otherwise. So that's one positive. Um, I can also stay in the hex and lose all the steps. And you might ask, well, why would you want to do that? Well, when you retreat, here's what happens. That's now deactivated. And in this game, <laughs> activation, deactivation, having the use of units is just absolutely crucial. Um, I mean, there are times when you wanna lick your wounds and go back and say, okay, I'm, I'm done. But this process of staying either staying activated and being able to continue in that operation in the battle cycles could be really important you might be desperate to actually take that hex whatever it may be maybe there's a base there that you need um so if i retreated yeah i i didn't have to lose five steps i only lost three great i've got more steps to use for later but on the other hand i have to de deactivate the unit and it's done. I can no longer use that in the operation. 
And if I want to use that unit again later in another operation, I'm going to have to pay for it. So instead, I may stay here and that loses the five steps. But you know what? Um, I've got five step loss, but I still got 11 steps left. And I can still do combat um, the next battle cycle if I've got a, a BCM left. And we'll talk about that in a second. So that's the difference between um, retreating and kind of licking your wounds, cutting, cutting your losses, but then losing chance for continuing or sticking around, taking more losses and being able to continue to fight within that operation. And I think that can be, uh, and I, I have to say this, um, <laughs> it's come up again and again as I've played the game especially in the campaign scenarios. I haven't tried strategic yet, but in the campaign scenarios, you have so many choices and that's what really makes this game fun. And the, the choices you are making make sense. It's not arbitrary. These are things you really have to think about as um, an operational player or a reaction player for that matter. So let's take a look at another possibility. Okay, second possibility um, to think about. Let's say this unit was broken. Uh, for whatever reason, I decided to still attack with it. And it could work the other way too. I mean, we, remember this this is like a mirror image. If, if a defending unit was broken and had to retreat, it would go through the same process. Um, so it's broken, it has, has a retreat, whether it was mandatory or voluntary. So you retreat the one hex. Now, because it's broken, I can't do any TQ check at all. I have no option. I have to take all the hits plus an extra one. So now, because this was broken when it, when it was fighting, it had five hits, now I have to add another one. It's going to have six hits from that combat. Plus, as usual, when you retreat, you have to deactivate. So that unit is done until the next um, operation when it might be able to be uh, to uh, activate it again. Okay. All right, now we have a kind of an artificial situation, but what the heck this could possibly happen in a real scenario. But we want to demonstrate what, what would happen if a unit can't retreat. And in this case, um, we have the hex that's occupied by, we'll just say this is the winning side with the two US regiments. Um, and then we have this Japanese division that is going to have to do a mandatory retreat. Well, in this case, we have a problem because it can't retreat into a hex that's occupied by an enemy unit. It can't go into a hex or cross a hex side where there's a ground attack arrow. So neither of these two hexes are okay. And it can't move into impassable terrain. Obviously, you can't go into open water with the infantry. So, what happens? Um, very simply, if, if it was a, an allied unit in this same situation and it was surrounded by Japanese or impassable terrain, the allied unit would surrender and that would be the end of it. Um, in this case, Japanese has uh, two possibilities. If the number of steps are for the allied side in this case are equal to or less than the number of steps that the Japanese have, then the Japanese do not retreat, but instead they stay in place 
and both sides take the full number of losses called for on the CRT, um, whatever the case may be. So if they were supposed to retreat, and uh, say it was this box right here, then the U.S. would take one step loss and the Japanese would take three step loss. And they would stay in place and they neither side deactivates the units. All right. If, uh, let's switch units around here and say we have the 16 step division and a six step regiment. So now we have more steps than the Japanese have in their, in the uh, hex. Now the Japanese uh, still can't retreat, um, but it is eliminated. And then you are actually going to have to take on when, once you eliminate this unit, you're going to have to take half as many steps as that unit had before the CRT result. That's important. You don't, you don't reduce this unit first and then check to see how many steps are left. It's whatever it had before you rolled. So it had 10 steps. You're going to have to take five steps off of these combat units that were in the battle. And um, they do not have to deactivate. So either way, if the Japanese unit is eliminated because it has fewer steps, the U.S. does not have to deactivate. If the Japanese stay in the hex, neither has to deactivate. So the, in this case, the U.S., once the Japanese is having a mandatory retreat, whether they stay in the hex or they're eliminated completely, the Allied side is going to be able to stay activated um, and use any more BCMs that they have left. And that will be actually our next little step is how the heck do you use these little markers? All right, cleaned it up a little bit here. Uh, and we've got two different units, this Japanese and the Allied side. And we've got some activated markers here. These are the BCM markers. And the most important thing to remember for BCM marker is what it stands for, Battle Cycle Movement. And there's a one, two, three, and a four, simply because when a unit is activated, let's say this one is flipped over, I paid the two points or possibly four or six, depending on the length of the operation, and I activated this unit. Any ground unit that's activated has to have one of these markers. If I have a three-week operation, 21 days, I'd give it three. Month-long, 28 would be four, seven for one, and 14 day would be a two. So let's just pretend they used, or they paid for a three-week, 21-day operation. So now we have a, th a three ECM marker under this unit. Well, just for the sake of the example, um, if the Japanese was the reaction player, they if they activate a ground unit, pay two points, they will automatically get a two because remember they'll have a 14 day uh, reaction um, reaction uh, length of time for their operation or during the operation. Um, so now, you're saying, well, how do those get used up? Because once they're used up, a unit has to deactivate. So it gets three times they can use this BCM before it's going to have to flip. The simplest way that it's, that it's used is during a battle cycle movement phase. If you move a ground unit, any number of... Um, points as far as the movement points, doesn't matter if it's just two points or all the movement points, you have to use up one BCM. 
So let's just say I moved into this hex. I've used one up. Now I only have two left. And remember that that's, it's possible that um, you're not using those BCMs every single battle cycle. It might be delayed. Um, so think of it as an operation over time and there's rest and refitting and reorganization, etc. It's not a continuous cycle of um, three days at a time or whatever. Okay, that's the simplest way you use up one of the BCMs. One way you don't use a BCM is when you load on to a ship. Um, I've actually have set up for Midway right now. Um, and uh, let's, uh, I've got some ships over here. Um, since this is a division, we're going to have to use this. So if I was to, to load this division onto a ship, that does not cost a BCM. Um, once I've embarked and I try to do a, either a landing somewhere or coming into port, once I have, have debarked onto land, whether it's amphibious invasion or uncontested, that will cost a BCM. Let's just throw it down to one. Okay. Another way you can use lose a, or use up a BCM, um, and this is actually if you another way to use um, use up a BCM is if in a previous battle cycle, let's say these two units fought it out and they ended up staying in the hex, nobody's deactivated. On my ensuing um, ground combat. Um, the operational player, again, we'll just say it's the U.S. If there are units of both sides in this hex, I have to initiate combat or I'm done. If I initiate combat, um, I'll use up my last, in this case, it'll use up the last activation, the BCM activation, and we'll do the combat and then it'll be, it'll be flipped no matter what happens after that. So again, moving takes up a BCM. Um, if you traveled by ship and you're uh, debarking, whether it's invasion or not, that's gonna cost a BCM. I mean, that's kind of like moving. And then if you're in a hex already um, and you haven't moved in during that battle cycle, you'll have to decide to either use that BCM up or deactivate automatically without doing any combat. So you either have to do the combat and use a BCM or lose all of them and deactivate. Okay, and finally, one more situation with BCM use. If I have some units locked uh, from a previous um, uh, um, combat phase, ground combat phase, and I have another unit coming into the hex, I've got a choice. I can either have a combat happen, or I can choose not to have the combat, but either way, I still have to expend a BCM. Um, otherwise, I'd have to deactivate. So, there are choices that you have as you go along, but basically BCM use is um, often either moving during battle cycles or um, having combat when you are already in the hex together, um, whether it's being reinforced or not. Um, one, one last little note about amphibious assaults. Let's um, pretend we've got this is not going to happen because it's too big. Let's let's do this. 
still a little bit outnumbered. But let's um, say we're doing an amphibious assault here on this hex. Um, once I've committed to the attack and we follow through with the combat results, if this uh, amphibious assaulting unit, in this case the Marine unit, the US Marine, if they have to suffer a mandatory retreat, and remember that could be, it could end up being voluntary retreat, um, but if it's, if it's a retreat off of this amphibious assault, they can go back on the ships, but they're going, they're going to retreat back to the ships, but they will have to take double the losses. Um, if they were required to take two losses, they would have to take four. Obviously, the, that would not be good news for this one step unit, but um, that that retreat can be um, very, very, very significant if you're having to lose a lot of steps that way. Um, and then finally, pursuing, if uh, we're back to this hex and we had a retreat um, by this unit, it was able to retreat this way. Um, I can actually pursue by taking a, um, an extra step loss by the pursuing units, but I have to take a t uh, pass a TQ check first. So I have to roll seven or less. If I roll a seven or less, uh, I can pursue and we'll move any or all of those units into, if there's more than one, into that hex. And then this particular unit is going to have to um, take half again as many as they as steps as they lost on the original CRT results. So if they had four step losses here and this able, this unit was able to pursue, they'd have to take two more. Again, those are rounded up. So three step loss here, they'd have to take two more steps there. Okay, one last little item uh, concerning ground combat and more is related to engineers and uh, bases. And then th this is a situation that came up in my Guadalcanal campaign that I tried and before I understood some of the details, the rules, especially with engineers and taking over bases. Um, when you do an assault um, or attack a, a base, whether or not it has a, another unit there, if the US was able to retreat that infantry regiment out of this base hex. Normally, if, if we were in this situation and we had an amphibious assault and this unit came in alone, knocked this out of the hex, or maybe reduced it all together, once that happens, the base unit is uh, just destroyed and you'll have to start over um, in terms of building one. If you have an engineer unit stacked with the other ground combat unit and the same thing happens, you get into the hex, you retreat or destroy any of the uh, enemy infantry that's there, immediately with the engineer along for the ride, immediately you can replace that base hex with one of your own. And that is huge because normally if you're, if you're doing a campaign, it'll take the U.S. Um, a full two uh, 
cycles through operations to, to build a new base. Um, it's shorter than the Japanese, a small base that is, it's shorter than the Japanese um, takes, but it's still kind of a pain. You're going to have to wait those two cycles out. The first cycle, they'll, they'll be able to get one started. It'll be in building phase, and then they have to make sure they don't enter combat. And then the next time around, they'll be able to take that off. And then the, the following battle cycle, they'll be able to use that base as um, normal. Um, but either way, it's, it's really going to help the Japanese, but either side, it helps quite a bit. So if you're planning on capturing any enemy bases, if at all possible, make sure that you have an engineer unit with you when you do that attack. If you have any idea that you're probably going to be successful. And it's very obvious if, if the base is by itself, because you'll be able to um, overrun that hex. Um, base has a minimal um, number of factors to be able to, or steps to be able to fight against um, regular infantry when they're by themselves. So use those engineers. That's what they're there for. All right. Um, I, I'm going to just admit at the end of this video that the ground combat is my least secure process that Pacific War offers as far as the, the things you do often in um, campaigns and, and battle scenarios, whatnot. Um, and I, I, I find myself checking those, those retreat rules uh, more often than not, um, just to make sure that I'm doing the process right especially when it concerns to battle cycle movement use. Um, so I'm hoping that helps, at least walks you through the, the basics. And then if you're a little farther along than I am, you can say, hey, have you thought about this or you forgot about this? Um, that would be greatly appreciated. So just uh, throw, a, throw a line in the comments. Uh, it'd be very welcome. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. I'm off to figure out some uh, variety, a variety of ways to attack the midway scenario from both sides. So I'm interested. I haven't, I haven't played that properly yet. So we'll see you next time. Bye.